hello happy easter or whatever way you choose to look at this particular sunday and welcome to our regular as it's become now science q and a uh today we're going to be joined by uh chris lintot helen chersky and sarah parker uh, before that i will just quickly run you through uh, a little bit of housekeeping first of all uh if for kids and you as an adult and you kids who are watching as well i mean i don't know who's watching this J despite what they say i can't see you after all um but uh the important thing we yesterday on saturday morning we did a, a kids celebration of scientific ideas with helen chersky you're going to be seeing shortly with suze kundu with dallas campbell and others that is up online and uh it was great wonderful so many different ideas and uh, we have lots of questions again this week uh both from children and adults and uh, we will be going through all of those we'll be talking about outer space in a space and things in between and i know that i definitely have some questions in which all three people will go i hope the other person answers that because there's a couple that are in that that interim area between their specialities uh i should also say we're gonna uh, end the show tonight uh, end the show tonight this afternoon wherever you're watching this morning in fact even to look at a day really when we think of the the cosmic yeah you know, the size of it all let's not just turn this into a 24-hour event uh but we also have a wonderful song from jed potts who is a member of blues water amongst other things fantastic blues band you might have seen earlier on in the week we had uh natalie smith uh who's also from blues water doing a couple of very very lovely songs and we're going to have uh his song which is written uh nicole smith sorry i got that wrong uh especially for uh, apollo 13 because we are at anniversary time of apollo 13 so we'll be hearing at the end of the show a song called uh talking apollo 13 blues uh also mention the tip jar at the bottom of this we are trying to get as big a fund as possible for some of the people who have been hard hit by the fact that all of their work has ended for some people in the entertainment industry singers artists comedians all manner of things there there, there is no work and their diaries have been cleared out and we try and have a resource for some of those people when they kind of hit the wall so anything that we get don't worry the money does not go to me uh it will go to some of the people who are finding it particularly difficult at the moment by having no work and we're also trying to use that money as much as possible if we make enough for some of the art centres you might have seen in the news already a few art centres have gone down a lot of art centres are not merely a place where people go and see shows in the evening they are a place where people gather during the day especially in smaller communities and we're trying to make sure that we can make enough money to send that to some of our favourite art centres who we know are struggling um, at the moment and uh, also tell you about next week's guests uh, tomorrow we have uh, Stuart Lee uh, is our, our guest as well as Sam West who's going to be doing some things and I'll tell you about all the other guests later on um two more god there's so much housekeeping today that trent sent me um also uh chris who's our guest is going to be on sky at night tonight as well as lucy who you may have seen earlier on in the week uh lucy green she is also going to be on and also mentioned that mark thompson who you can follow on twitter etc he's doing some family stargazing events during this period of isolation and it is a wonderful time to look at the sky as well i'm sure you have uh, for anyone because we have such a small patch of sky we're not moving anywhere it's a, I, every single night i look at dusk at the moment now i always go and see how the sun is moving and how it is illuminating the sky and uh, it's a really joyous thing and also to look at venus and all of those other things so that's everything done uh give us money look at the sky these are the main messages of today and i'm going to do my show and tell uh before everyone else today uh my my show and tell is this i hope you can see it it's a it's a trandom uh one of the great painful cycling innovations a three seater bicycle uh, an image there with all of the notes about the trandom taken from the goodies file and as some of you will know very sadly uh, we found out today that timber taylor had died um timber taylor for many of us many of my generation and for many generations of course in in, in australia where the the goodies remained lauded while in, in this country the bbc didn't repeat their shows very often um they meant a great deal to a lot of people a lot of us when we were growing up a lot of us who may well have been sometimes feeling that we were on the outside or in the margins and uh, sometimes when things were difficult having something like the goodies knowing that was going to be on that week meant a great deal and it made it sometimes easier during that period of growing up i was lucky enough in january to do two events with tim i did an event all about at last the 1948 show please go and look at the work he did on that he did some incredible physical comedy there uh, of course he also wrote the uh was 
one of the writers of the Four Yorkshiremen sketch. And uh, he did say he received a small check from Monty Python after they played the O2. And I also did an event with him about the 50th anniversary of the goodies, which um, we were going to put out this week. I'm not entirely sure whether we will be putting it out this week now. Um, we will certainly be putting it out. It was a lovely um, evening. But uh, the show and tell of the Trandon is just uh, in celebration of an artist and a performer who made many people's lives better by his joie de vivre. When I did I, I mean, the, the weekend that I worked with him, he had a total of six events stretching from Worthing to Bradford and then the four events doing in Bristol. And every single one he approached without any grumbling, with just uh, a, a big heart and a fast mind. And it was a wonderful thing. So thank you very much, Tim Brooke Taylor. In some ways, that is the show and tell and i'm so glad as well sometimes you feel embarrassed when you do events with people who've, who've met and, and you don't get around I'm, i was really glad that i i got him there there all the goodies there signed the goodies file after not merely that i made them sign all the goodies books as well i imagine they were swearing at me afterwards um but thank you very much tim Brooke taylor and uh we'll now move on with the science q a so um Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I don't know if, don't know if you're, you're um, a, I don't know if you're a, a bit younger than me, and I, I, I wondered where, how much. Uh, certainly, I, I would imagine. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. Has played a part in such a. You know, I've, I was watching the, the TV footage of, of Tim doing uh, a "Girlfriend in a Coma" to the music of "Tiptoe Through the Tulips" this morning, um, which was delightful. So I wondered whether uh, any of you have. Uh, I should say, just say Helen Helen Chersky uh, in in one corner. It's not a boxing competition though it is sometimes a battle of ideas uh in another corner uh chris lintor in a third corner making this boxing tournament of ideas even more difficult sarah parkak who i first met in toronto who we're going to talk a lot about her work as a space archaeologist but anyway i wonder if anyone any of you did have memories of of of, of tim and his work just thought i was brought up like listening, like, listening i'm sorry i haven't a clue and it's amazing you get to and i'm and i'm I, I feel like i don't know i'm 41 now um but that means i was listening to i'm sorry i haven't a clue for 40 years and the consistency of it and the the way it never stopped being modern while still being very you know um sort of uh you knew what you were getting in a way you know it was it was the same idea and yet it was made new every week by these brilliant brilliant people and he was just such a feature so yeah and my my mum I think had a, an album of the goodies that I got passed on so I only knew about the goodies to this sort of old hardback book but yeah it's it's one of those voices that you realize has been with you all your life and it's very sad that it, it won't be anymore and it is uh, there's such delight as well we when do we were doing this event when you see uh bill on top of the pops doing the funky gibbon uh which i know for for many evolutionary biologists and 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 others uh, you know they do have problems with some of the actual practical science of the gibbon uh but the funky gibbon on top of the pops where you see graham and tim behind bill in their dungarees going oh no bill's written a, a, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to go for this we're in ridiculous dungarees it's a, it's a very beautiful thing sarah i know you were you know you, you lived in the UK for a while. I don't know whether you ha had a chance at all to, to uh, come across either the goodies or uh, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. Um, I mean, a little, a little bit here and there. Um, I unfortunately didn't, didn't grow up with it. Um, but obviously seeing all the news today is just very sad. We're, we're losing some extraordinary legends. Um, so yeah, I, I occasionally would, would see clips um, on, on TV or on the internet and it always just brought me such joy so um, i'm very very sad about this properly ridiculous beautiful uh, stupidity um and uh, and chris uh, i'm sorry i haven't a clue that i used to have radio four on when i was um trying to work out what to do at the weekends while being a teenager and as helen said it it shouldn't be funny but that group of people just made the same thing sound uh, amazing and i used to i, I used to send it to visiting american uh, postdocs or, or PhD students to try and explain uh, the UK. I think they found Mornington Crescent funny. Then they're, they're doing okay. So that 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 was that was my generation's interaction with him. I think, and um, it, it is sad, but I have seen the Funky Gibbon already today, and I will watch it again uh, oh, before yeah. the end of the day for sure. It's it's brilliant. It's wonderful. Um, Oh, anyway, the, the science uh, element now, and I'm going to start off, Sarah, with you, because uh, what you do is it's it's always the moment that uh, I tell people what you do. They go, well, what, what, you know, the first excitement as, as a space archaeologist is some people go, oh, so there is archaeology on other planets. The governments have been keeping it secret. There are alien civilizations. That's not what's going on, is it? 
Well, not yet anyway. I mean, I have my dream, dreams about someday working for NASA. Uh, but yeah, you got to flip the satellites back to Earth. So it's essentially using space and airborne um, based sensors to map and model um, clues and hints that indicate where past civilizations or remnants of previous peoples or or things like ancient river courses may have been. And they help help us to really understand how and why landscapes evolved through time. And it's not just that we're using satellites and looking down, it's that so many hints and traces of these ancient places are obscured by vegetation, by soil, by water. And by looking at different parts of the light spectrum and manipulating the imagery, um, you can make these whole landscapes just appear out of nothing. Think of like a space-based x-ray or cat scan well you i mean that's what I, I images found. that i've seen where you'd been investigating areas where we knew there were some kind of remains of civilization but presumptions had been made uh about how limited the structures were and i'm, I'm trying to think there's a is it Angwat temple in particular where uh the, the there's a whole new story there isn't there by, by space archaeology yeah. everything changes so that, that's work by my, my dear friend and colleague, um, Damian Evans. And so obviously, if you visit Angkor Wat today, it's beautiful, today, it's beautiful, but so much of that landscape is obscured by dense rainforest vegetation. You go to the temples. And, and when I went a couple of years ago with my husband, I remember, like, I study it, and I didn't appreciate just how vast the landscapes were. You drive through the outer temple wall, and you keep going and going and going for almost a kilometer, and then you'd hit the inner temple wall. Um, and, and what the, what what they use there is something called LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, and it's a sensor system that's typically flown in a helicopter or UAV, and it sends down millions of pulse beams of, of, of light or lasers, and it allows you to strip away the overlaying vegetation, and you get a bare earth model. And what he and his colleagues have found, just unbelievable evidence for the dense occupation of, uh, of, of the Khmer Empire, and they've been able to use all that data to show how the empire potentially collapsed a thousand years ago. So it's just amazing. And it just shows the vast scale, things we simply couldn't have even imagined were there. We had a question from uh, Sino. How soon after we had gone into space did we realize the potential of being, to, of, of being able to observe uh, archaeology? So actually, so this goes back. So this way, goes back way, way, way before um, space. Um, some of the first space archaeology, as it were, was done from a balloon back in 1906 around Stonehenge. Uh, and sort of from these early pictures, you can actually see traces of damp earth that indicate buried architecture. So we've been doing this type. I mean, then of course it was aerial archaeology, but we've been we've been doing it ever since we could sneak up into the sky in any way possible. So first it was balloons, then it was airplanes in World War One, World War Two, then it was spy photographs in the 1960s, and now of course um, with with satellites. You know, in the 1970s, 1980s, with the the launch, as it were, of the U.S. Um, NASA Landsat program, as soon as archaeologists got their hands on that data in the 70s and the 80s, they started using it to map um, potential locations of ancient structures. So we've been using it as long as we've been able to. And talking earlier the about that for a lot of people, a lot of my generation, they, they were a huge influence about why we became who we became in terms of our career. I know that you had also, you, you had a different childhood influence, which is why you have become who you have become. Yeah, so of course, you know, like a lot of the kids in the 1980s, in the 1980s, I think I'm 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 roughly the same age as 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 um, as, as the other two folks here. Uh, you know, I we rent rent a videotape every Friday night, and uh, Indiana Jones um, came out in the early 1980s, and we watched it constantly. You know, that was on rotation along with Never Ending Story, Princess Bride, and Willow. Um, I now have all of those memorized, and now we watch them with our seven-year-old again and again and again. Uh, but yeah, I, I watched Indiana Jones and and fell in love with the story and the character. Obviously, he's problematic today, but still, I, I can't help it. I can't help that I'm, I would, my whole generation, every archaeologist who's in their sort of 30s, 40s, and probably 50s um, grew up with Indiana Jones, and, and that just played a role in influencing my career path. And you did get to meet him as well, didn't you? Harris I did. I did. Yeah. It was it was it, it extraordinary. It was a couple of years ago at TED. Um, he happened to be there. Um, they've been trying to get him to come for years. I was sort of the lore that that pulled him in. They said your number one fan is 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 going to be there. You've got got to meet her. And it was the year that I got to give my presentation on the main stage. Actually, Steven Spielberg was in the audience as as well. So I mean, who gets to do that? Who gets to honor kind of their the people that created their their childhood dreams? 
Williams. Um, so I ended up having lunch with Harrison Ford. Uh, he is the most charming, kind, and decent human. Um, he was so sweet. He was so complimentary. Uh, and, and I can never help myself, as you know, Robin. So I actually brought my fedora. And he <laughs> looked at it and he said, you brought the bleeping hat. He, <laughs> he said, you and only you are allowed to get away with that. Um, so we actually have some really lovely photos. And one of them um, were, were fighting over the hat. So that one's getting framed and put on the wall. But he's Brilliant. lovely. We'll, we'll come back to you now. Um, Helen, do you have any pop culture influences who you think have in some ways uh, shaped your oceanography, physics, or any of the other areas that you've been uh, uh, involved, in? involved in? No, no I, get, I do get asked this question. And there is this kind of myth that you need a reason. And obviously, there are lots of you know, broader reasons that people do things. But there is the, there is a thing that some scientists uh, and lots of people in other professions, uh, like Sarah said, there's a thing, a single influence. But for most people, we just muddle along until we end up doing you know, something we like or we don't. And so I have never been able to identify a particular external thing. You know, I had parents who would just said, oh, well, let's find out and do your best. Those were the two things. And and so I didn't have, but I think it's really important that you don't need this kind of creation myth for a career. You don't need the, the, the lottery finger to point, to come out of the sky one day and point at you and go, you are going to be, a, you know, like the hat thing in Harry Potter. And so I'm like most scientists, I just muddled along and I knew I was interested in physics because it showed how things worked. And what I really wanted to know was how things worked. And then I discovered the ocean later in life in my 20s. And I was really how how had the world not told me that this thing existed and it still bugs me now that that we don't talk about it more so obviously i fly the flag for talking about it but i do think that not it is not the case that all scientists have this you know creation myth some of us just got there by accident <laughs> So your show and tell today to find out how much you've uh, managed to learn in this with time curiosity is something uh, rather wonderful and strange. It is definitely. So, so, I, so should, I should point out I'm a lifelong vegetarian. I am not the sort of person who has bits of dead animal lying around. However, <laughs> this this thing is the exception. Now, it uh, it's about five centimetres square. That's the back of it. This is the front of it. And it's got this little sort of pointy bit on top and this is a scoot from the back of an alligator um and the reason i have got it is that i hacked it off the back of the alligator with a uh pen knife now i should point out that the alligator was very dead at this point um the reason we had gone to see the alligators is that i was making a documentary um about uh the physics of the natural world and how animals interact with sound in this particular case and you know so an alligator's back um it's it's got skin like other animals do but inside the skin it's got this very regular array it's almost like egg boxes of these kind of and they are almost square it's a very regular square type shape and and the alligators do something really interesting with these shapes which is that they use this grid to generate something that a physicist would call a parametric resonance but what it means effectively is that under just the alligator will sink its back down so it's just underneath the water and then it will oscillate its lungs at a frequency that is too low for us to hear but the physics of these little points in this very regular spacing means that um, the water above them starts to splash up in this resonance. You get these really this splashing that goes way up above the water surface. And I think Trent has a video uh, that is going to play of this process happening. <laughs> So, so what is going on here is that um, there's this really specific bit of physics, but it's an ancient process. So what the alligator is doing is it's a mating call. There's two bits to the call. There's the bit that makes the slashes and the other bit that we can hear. And um, the great thing about these things is that alligators, there's, there's evidence that, you know, circumstantial evidence that alligators have been doing this for millions of years to make their calls. But the brilliant thing is they set each other off. So the, this is all in Florida and the alligators are all in the swamp. It's a big, deep noise. And they said that when the space shuttle used to land at Cape Canaveral, all the alligators would start doing their mating call because they heard this big, deep noise that came in. But the reason they can do it is these really regular scoots on top of the... Um, Top of the thing. I should add that this, you know, hacking things off dead animals isn't recommended. I brought it home and I asked Alex, Alice Roberts what to do with it. And she said, oh, just dry it out. But I put it in bleach and a load of other things because I didn't really want dead alligator knocking around. But it, it seems to be all right. You must have, Chris, you must have been out in Florida for a, a, a few launches in, in, the, in the past. Um, 
You know I haven't. I've never seen anything launch from Cape Canaveral. I have seen launches, but from uh, ESA, the European Space Agency ah. site in French Guiana, which is similarly jungly uh, and is quite the most bizarre place I've ever been. So there's basically nothing there except for one town plus the the rocket launch pad. And, and the rockets go over the town. So they, when there's a launch, they have to evacuate and, and and the place shuts down for for a few hours so that the rocket can happen uh, safely. But it it is the most amazing thing to to see a launch even without the alligators. Um, and the thing I, I I always shocks me is that you see the rocket move in this arc up into the sky, and then you hear the sound of it. But of course, the sound takes longer to get to us than the the image of the rocket. So the sound follows the rocket, but with a delay, and so you get this sort of delayed follow um almost a shadow rocket the one that you're watching it, it's really quite spectacular i've never seen a, a lot i have seen duran duran at cape canaveral that's the best i can do um, um what's your uh... well, did the alligators sing their mating calls in response to the duran duran concert I you know this, what this could be Simon... important scientific information Simon was so worried about that that he had them all removed for fear that they may well then take <laughs> over from his. Uh, they were. It was, it was a very interesting. Uh, my favourite moment was that they did half an hour of space-based songs. This was during the fiftieth anniversary uh, of Apollo Eleven, and then there was a wonderful moment where Simon Le Bon started. They did "Walking on the Moon," and you could see the whole band went, "Oh, Simon, you have started a note too high," and it was a really beautiful thing to watch him going. How am I going to find my way back to a note where I can? and then start moving. It was great. Um, what is your show and tell today, Chris? Um, it, it's probably the smallest thing anyone's bought Yeah, It's this grey dot, which hopefully you can see. So the mm. white is just a mount. It's this... Oh, we're going to freeze there, I think. I don't know if anyone else it's is... A piece... There we are. Yeah, Chris, we're having yeah. a slight... slight uh, we're going a little okay. bit of a bad connection there. Can we do, So we can just see the small dot. Can you run, run us through that again? Yeah. So, so this is a meteorite. Uh, it's a piece of a meteorite that fell in Morocco in 2011. Uh, but it's very special because this is part of one of the 200 or so meteorites that are known to come from Mars. So this is a piece of the planet Mars, uh, which I carry around with me. Um, and for me, there's something amazing about the fact that I can hold a part of a, a planet that I can see in the sky, that I can connect to this object uh, that I get to carry around with me. And it's interesting. I, I often show this to people and, and hand it to them. And, and there are two kinds of people. There are people who look at it and say, it looks like a grey dot. It's just a blob. And then there are people who, when you let them hold it, go a bit quiet and enjoy the fact that they're holding a piece of another planet. And I think you see this as well. Lots of museums around the world have uh, lunar samples, moon rocks, brought back by the Apollo astronauts. And they're often neglected and in the corner and, and people walk past them. And I, I always want to, to grab people and say, look, you've just walked past a piece of the moon. Do you not want to pay attention to that for a second? So so this is my piece of Mars. And um, everyone, I think, should get a chance to hold uh, another planet at least once. Well, it is it's a facet that that thing where I've been talking to a lot of scientists recently about recently the about important, the importance of connection, and that I think that sometimes that gets missed out in the, in the in the bare basics of science education, the way that the cosmological story connects us to so many things. Like anyone who's held a piece of meteorite, where you suddenly you, the the density of it is such a or a, so it, it's, it's such a peculiar thing. So it's it's whenever you pick up an object and it's not the weight you think, and that one you go what that that how is there's too much weight in this. And that immediately starts to give you a greater sense of the story of, uh, of, of what the universe is, is made of and, and, and its possibilities. Yeah, the, the dense ones are these iron meteorites often, which are, which are heavy and, and dense. And there are a couple exactly. of goals around the UK. There's, there's one on the entrance to the observatory at Greenwich. Um, and I always touch it whenever I go past. I've just always done that ever since I went there as a, a kid. Um, but as a kid, I remember thinking not only that it was sort of metallic and asteroidy, but it was cold. And I thought, ah, space is cold. And so the meteorite must be, which is, of course, complete nonsense. But it created the, this nice connection. And, and meteorites are, are this rare thing that do this for astronomy most of the time our subject is uh, about looking 
Um, I don't get to run experiments. I don't get to go and prod a galaxy and see how it's feeling. But meteorites are a way of, of sort of doing lab work on, on the cosmos. Um, and I actually ended up, I did a PhD on cosmochemistry, on astrochemistry, because I wanted that connection between something on Earth and the observations that we can make with our telescopes. Sarah, do you find in your find work, in your work again the, getting these images, getting these images of what would have been ancient structures and the sense of them? Do you find that does change your sense of connection with the idea of of, of human civilization and the human civilization story. and the human story? I think, yeah, I think over time it's it's given me what I think a, a lot of um, astronauts who live on the space station experience. It's the, this overview effect. Um, it's this idea of c connectivity and, and not seeing borders. Um, I, uh, whether I was interested in it beforehand or got influenced by the satellite imagery, I, I, I don't know, but this idea of how connected we are to environments and how subtle changes and things like river courses can completely alter the path of a civilization or a city, um, that that's profoundly impacted. I think the way I, I think about us in the past and also us today, whether it's a shift in a river course or, or, or a pandemic that seems to come out of nowhere and then, then everything changes. So I think that's what the satellite imagery interpretation has done for me. I'm always thinking about interrelationships. So your show and tell today, can we see what you've, you've brought? Okay. Okay. So this is to honor everybody who is at home. This is the ancient Egyptian god Bess. Bess was the god of the household in ancient Egypt. He was also the god of childbirth, of singing, music, and dance. Uh, per, uh, I think uh, sort of a god, a god for our times now. Um, he was incredibly popular throughout ancient Egypt. Um, we we know there are no temples to the god Bess, which is kind of interesting. But he was in so many everyday Egyptian houses, so he was a common household deity. Um, he uh, really started getting popular, sort of post. Middle Kingdom to about 2,000 years ago, uh, and he's just this little imp. He's a he's a beautiful. He's he's multifaceted, um, and and to me, I think he honors this this time. And that not only is he the god of household, but we're seeing so many wonderful images of people singing and playing music and connecting with each other. And all those things were just as important to people that lived thousands of years ago. So we haven't changed as much as we think. And I also before saw we started. This is one of the things that I love is that you are you know, space archaeology, but you still when once you once you've got the information, you also have to do the digging up as well, don't you? Oh, that yes. still doesn't. I, my my beloved, I'm very sorry for everyone in the UK. Yes, this they, is a Marshall yes, town. This is a Marshall town. This is not one of your fancy little British trolls. I also have one of them. Um, but but this is my this is my hand extension my magic wand. Um, yeah, I mean it's just as important, you know, the 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 um, geospatial analytics, the the remote sensing work we do. Obviously, it's important to do uh, before you get out into the field to pinpoint where you're going. But ultimately, you're not going to get that that information uh, the, about the pottery and the and the material culture and and the soil until you excavate and survey and map. So um, I direct a project uh, at a site called El Lisht. It was ancient Egypt's capital about 3,800 years ago. Um, about two hours south of Cairo, and uh, I cannot wait to get back into the field as soon as this is all over. You do miss the field. The last time I saw you, you were quite caught up in having to deal with kind of academia and and not able to actually get get out there. And I presume that like everyone in so many different forms at the moment, you know, obviously for for people like me, it's the the lack of the 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 audience and the the uh, frequent desire for approbation. Um, but for you to actually, you know, to, I, I presume there's a limited amount of soil in your back garden and a limited number of potential temples that may well have been there. Yeah, I'm looking. I haven't found any yet. Um, I'm I'm I'm, I'm Ever the optimist. <laughs> uh, I've been spending a ridiculous amount of time in our garden. Our garden is going to be insane this year. Um, we were just out in Egypt at the end of the year into the new year. I had meetings with colleagues, kind of getting things set up for our season. We were supposed to go out in May and June. Um, obviously gutted, but you know I'm I'm on the phone constantly with my friends and colleagues in Egypt. Um, you know, ho hoping things calm down so that we can get back as soon as possible. But yeah, I mean, normally we go out once a year for about a month to six weeks. So yeah, I, I I'm getting itchy fingers. So yeah, you're going to see actually probably a full scale uh, archaeological excavation in my backyard in a couple of weeks. Brilliant. I'm gonna right. We're gonna run through. We've got loads of different uh, questions now. The first question actually I think is one of those ones where. I'm not sure. I think it might be Helen, but I could be Chris. And then Sarah, I, I'm not sure this one. This is uh, from Archangel. Uh, happy Easter Sunday again. Uh, and this is, uh, what is physics like at the very edge of our expanding universe? 
eeny, meeny, miny now. Where are we going to go with this? That's a Chris question. Yeah. Chris, <laughs> how many years? I, I lost the end of that. Where, what's the physics like? At the edge of the expanding universe. Ah, that's a really easy question. It's exactly <laughs> the same as it is here. So there's no edge to the universe. If you went to the edge of, of what we can see and look back, you just see the universe just as we do. So physics, we think, is the same. Ever. But it's it is a really interesting assumption that we absolutely base all of modern physics on is that whatever laws we find out about here also apply in other places. And so far, we haven't got any reason not to think that's true. But it is, and it's an astonishing, astonishing assumption when you really think about it. So, um, yeah, I, it, I mean, it's it's a it is, but we can we can we we can test so things like we see hydrogen from very distant galaxies, and um, we know it's hydrogen because it emits uh, or absorbs light at a particular wavelength, and the fact that that wavelength is the same gives you a, a sense that many of the fundamental constants of physics haven't changed in the last 13 billion years or haven't changed across that great distance. So it is a fundamental assumption, but 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 we can test it, uh, and people do, which I think is rather wonderful. Something which is slightly, I would highly, highly recommend, I, I interviewed Katie Mack the other day, who's written a really wonderful book about the different ideas of the end of the universe called The End of Everything. And I, I was blown away by the fact that when you're looking across the universe, obviously things look smaller and smaller the further away they are, until you get to, some, suddenly you go, hang on, that galaxy is further away, but looks bigger. And I'm not going to tell you the answer because I can't remember it exactly. But nevertheless, it is a really beautiful moment where you find out when we look very, very far back into the universe how our 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 senses uh, and and our, our way of dealing with it uh change and and the, and light and sight oh it's man it's brilliant um tim that has a question which is um this we've had a lot of different versions of this this week and i'll start with you the chance to crunch some numbers on the positive effects of this current lockdown on the global environment now this is a lot of people are bringing up this because so much has changed during this very limited period of time um what is there anything we can any any judgment we, we we can make or any new knowledge that we have knowledge that well, we have from this well there's certainly a lot of armchair experts so we have definitely seen an epidemic of those accompanying <laughs> the main one so there are obviously a lot of the problem is we don't have very good numbers on anything yet what we do have is a lot of people saying oh i assume this must be so and i'm going to write something about it because i think obviously it must be so so data on this is definitely limited and i would be very cautious about re reading to too much into all these predictions uh, because people are just having opinions. We don't have the data yet. The, the biggest thing to say is that in terms of our influence on the planet, this is a short term thing. You know, human influence since the Industrial Revolution, you're talking centuries and two months of things not happening is not actually going to make the environment an awful lot better. And so what will be important is any habits we change afterwards. But in terms of things right now, yeah, you know, we can all hear the bird song. Now, was it that the birds weren't calling before or is it that the traffic has just gone down so that we can actually hear them and there's nothing else to listen to? It's a tough thing to say. We can absolutely see that emissions of reduced pollution is way down. That is data on that is available. Pollution is way down in cities. I think I saw um, an estimate that, you know, sort of as low in London as, it, as it's been since the 1940s or something um so so there are some data on things like pollution that have definitely gone down but in terms of the larger scale effects of exactly how animals are moving it's such a short period of time basically we can't assume that we're, we're banking up environmental brownie points here because it's the long-term habits that are making the difference not whether we spend a month not driving so so the answer is kind of yes and no on that one i think this is uh for, i think for you sarah this is um becky and uh she would like to know is it true there's a huge gap in our knowledge about soil and what are the most important issues about the way that we are able to examine and understand things from soil from soil okay so um we actually know a lot about soil and there's a whole sort of subspecialization within archaeology people that focus on soil soil chemistry 
Um, there are so many remnants of um, past activities that can be detected in soils, so particular chemicals that indicate um, farming or human waste. Um, of course, uh, when, we, when you examine soil microscopically, you can see evidence of, of seeds, um, other bits of material culture. So, so soil is, is just a crucial, crucial part of archaeology. Um, and what uh, we'll often do, and it's something that, that I love doing, um, so in some cases you can't actually um, excavate or maybe you want to uh, get a, a better sense of what's happening to a landscape long term, but you don't want to invest all the resources to say open up a 10 by 10 meter square and go down a couple meters. So we'll do something called coring or augering. So we'll use a core or an auger about 10 centimeters across and we'll go down 5, 10, 15, 20 meters, especially in places like the Egyptian floodplain where you have deposition. Of, of, of the annual floods plus material culture over time. And we use that to get sort of a snapshot, just like uh, the just like paleoclimatologists do in, um, in, in um, using ice cores, to really understand sort of what and how and why the landscapes evolved over time. So, yeah, I mean, the more work we do on soil, the more we understand that's possible. I think I, I think I just saw a paper, maybe it was in PNAS or Science or Nature, that you can actually get really good dating information in caves from the soil um, that's there. So there are all these advances and breakthroughs that are being made all the time. Um, um, I, I think it's just a, a crucial part of what we do. Thank you. Question. The, um, thank uh, you. Um, this is a question from Monica, but actually for her son, Carlos. And I think this is a Chris question. Uh, Carlos wants a telescope for his birthday. Uh, our budget is about 100 euros. Ideally, we'd like one that we can see Saturn with. Is that realistic? Are there any recommendations? And I'm, so they've only they've, they've got limited budget, about 100 euros. They want a telescope so they can look at the rings of Saturn and Saturn. Yeah. Saturn. Yeah. So so small telescopes uh, are relatively cheap these days. You might just be able to get something for that budget. The, the thing to remember uh, in old currency, I only know this in inches, but if, if, if your telescope has a lens, you want a telescope that's got a lens of at least three inches across and if you've got if you've, your telescope has a mirror, it should be about six inches across. So lots of the very cheap telescopes you find are, are smaller than that, and they're basically useless. Um, so so that's the minimum size you're after, I think. But honestly, for that sort of budget, I think you'll get a lot more fun out of a pair of binoculars, um, which you can get easily and cheaply. Especially secondhand binoculars are, are very cheap, and I think um, you can see a lot in the sky with binoculars. You can see the moons of Jupiter. You can have great fun exploring the moon, looking at star clusters. And I think if you get a pair of binoculars and, and get hooked on that um, before deciding to get a telescope, then then that's a good idea. And then the third part of the advice is that or all over the world there are local astronomy clubs um, who will um, have telescopes and run public observing evenings and so it's not a bad idea to when we're able to to congregate again to seek them out um, and to go along to an observing session and, and try talking to them about telescopes because you might find there are different choices depending on whether you might at some point want to do photography or, or, or so on so uh, at least three inches if it's a, a lens six if it's a mirror um, binoculars are probably better to start with they're certainly easier to use and find a local astronomy club so you've got some advice uh, as well that, that, that those are the tips good luck monica and uh, and carlos uh this one is i, th I think for, for you and this is uh from carly thank you carly you send questions every week it's great um this is um what evidence is there of organisms adapting to climate change oh loads um so loads. um so and adapting can mean a few different things here. So there are um, adapting behaviour, which can happen quickly. Um, there's adapt and obviously adapting their physical nature, which is evolution, takes longer. Um, so there are lots of um, and obviously the other thing to say here is that climate change is just one of the pressures on the natural world. So sometimes it's hard to separate from things like noise pollution. Like do the birds go do the birds you know go this way and not that way because of the noise or because of the temperature? It's hard to tell. Um, so, but yeah, so um, there's definitely evidence of things happening earlier. The biggest thing you see is that even in this country, there's a uh, survey every year. And I think it's something like when the first daffodils come out or it's one of those signs of spring that everyone can go, oh, I've just seen a daffodil. We'll send in to the thing. And, and that date is creeping earlier every year. And so even in this country, watching something as simple as when a daffodil starts to bloom, you can see the relationship uh, with climate change. And then there are other things like, for example, the, the Thames here that runs through London has 
a lot now you may not this may come as a surprise to people the Thames has quite a lot of fish in it and not only has it got a lot of fish in it it's a really important nursery for the North Sea now sea bass did not were not traditionally found in the Thames they prefer warmer water but over the past few years we're starting to get sea bass here and now the Thames estuary is uh, the nursery for about 80% of the sea bass in the North Sea and that seems to be a warming temperature thing now that that can happen. There are natural fluctuations in temperature. There's all this. There's all these caveats that come with it all. However, we can already see these changes in behaviour um, and from other human impacts as well. So yes, there is strong evidence for that kind of thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Carly. Uh, this one, Sarah, for... Sophie wants to know how much have your ideas about human civilization changed through the work you've observed? Oh, e enormously. I mean, they seem to change every week um, and and certainly what's happening now in our world um, has profoundly impacted my understanding of an appreciation for um, that this concept of collapse in antiquity um, my colleagues and I who study collapse whether it's Egypt the Khmer uh, the Bronze Age we're all discussing um, uh, quite a bit about what we're seeing and how it compares and contrasts to what we're seeing happen in our world so it's one of the things I love about archaeology, you know, it's not fixed. Um, we, we see groundbreaking studies come out every week. You know, when I first started uh, in learning about about sort of when we became um, when we existed, right, early early Homo sapiens, it was a hundred thousand years, then two hundred thousand years, then three hundred thousand years, and now three hundred and thirty thousand years. That's the earliest evidence for Homo sapiens uh, in 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 Africa. And could could we have existed earlier as dating techniques get better? Could we push back that origin story? Even even more. Um, so that's, yeah, I love, that's what I love about archaeology. It's constantly changing. Um, you know, I, I read widely. I read from my colleagues in sociology and psychology um, and, and, and the sciences. So, um, yeah, I sort of, I tell people that, um, that, that, that archaeology as a field, we're sort of the, the thieves of academia. We're constantly taking <laughs> ideas and concepts from every other field possible to advance what we're doing, um, but it makes it fun. So, yeah, I'm very, very excited about, um, about where archaeology is headed. And, you know, I, I'm cool with I'm cool with being wrong. It's fine. I find that very what you've just been saying because I, I, I'm a scientist from different disciplines. The fact that as we become more specialised, there is at the same time it seems a greater overlap. Very often, which we see, you know, in physics and chemistry, it's so many different areas that even though it's becoming more specialised, it's not becoming now. It's only this discipline. The other ones are all, and um, that becomes part of the story. Yeah, I mean, I tell my students. Um, you know, it's just as important to double major in a science alongside anthropology or archaeology or archaeology. Um, that's really where, in my opinion, the, the opinion that the, the biggest advances are being made, whether it's computation, big data, uh, dating with, um, with, with physics, whether it's geochemistry, understanding ancient trade routes, uh, biology, DNA, um, genetics, uh, you know, definitely study, study both, have that broad perspective, um, you know, read widely. It's, it's essential for where archaeology is moving as a field. And we've just had uh, Katie Mack, and she's given me that quick ex explanation for the strangest of seeing more distant galaxies appearing to be closer. The short answer is that the really distant things are seen by us so far in the past that when they emitted the light we see, they were actually closer, and so their images take up more of the sky. Isn't that beautiful and wonderful and strange? Um, and uh, this is uh, for you, Chris. This is from Louise. She would like to know, I was part of a space rocket seeds project a couple of years ago with some teenagers. What is the best crop? grown so far in space so far in space i think there's been very little actually grown in space if i remember the seeds project correctly they took seeds into space and then they grew them down here on earth to see uh, whether they've been affected by passage in space it's something you might care about if you were uh, taking seeds on the long voyage to mars or, or or something like that so i'm not sure that anything hugely advanced as being grown in space certainly there's no salad garden on the space station so did they not grow some lettuce at some point i, just I think yeah there's sort of there is a, i think I, i've got watercress in the back of my head as well i think there have there have been a couple of attempts but we're, we're a long way from gardening my my, my space uh, plant fact is that the soil on mars is kind of alkaline um, due to the uh, chemical called perchlorate, which had all sorts of effects on experiments that the Viking landers did in the 70s. But that means if I've got my um, gardening hat on, um, Mars is perfect for as asparagus. 
So in, in the film The Martian, he grew potatoes, but we could be a, we could be a bit more ambitious than that in our culinary uh, thoughts about Mars, I think. Scott Kelly, as far as I remember, when he was on the ISS, he, I think in his book he talks about becoming quite close to the lettuces because uh, that thing where uh, I, I think sometimes you can be a bit of a loner and that thing, as, as we know, people who are given things to grow, it really does give it, it gives, uh, not that he didn't have a huge purpose already being on the ISS, but that bit, again, it's a strange thing of connection, isn't it, with living things, that it's not, you know, it doesn't mean you're talking to those things, but nevertheless, that sense of growth and that I sense of I think it's that change. sense of day-to-day, -day, yeah, like you said, with change, which you get which you get from this i get from the sky as well you talked at the top about looking at, at dusk every evening but just noticing we had full moon last wednesday which was spectacular and then just noticing uh, that the moon's now rising a couple of hours later that the phase is different and that it will be back round to new moon in in a week and a half or so i think that that sense of just watching things change from night to night uh, just the fact that every star rises four minutes uh earlier each day uh, it's the sort of thing that our civilization doesn't have like you know, if you, you know, talk to indigenous like what that's in a way the modern world has taken that from us and it is the thing that absolutely older communities took absolutely for granted because that was you know that was what they had if you talk to indigenous communities now that's kind of that's the first thing they see is they notice all those details and and really it's it's a hard thing because we've our society has sort of taken it from us and we've forgotten those skills but actually that's always been a really important part of being human is being connected to your surroundings because it, you you see that you are within it right you're a part of it you're not separate to it yeah i've been watching, the, watching birds. the birds out the window while working from home for the last few weeks i found myself texting ornithologist friends or bird watchers with stupid questions like where do birds go when it's windy <laughs> uh, which had never occurred as an astronomer. I'd never, I'd never thought about that before. But they weren't there when the wind was up, and so apparently fields, fields of bushes, uh, was the answer I was given. But then I was chastised for using the term pigeony thing, uh, which <laughs> I think is a perfectly sensible uh, label. But anyway, this is the point: paying attention gives you the sense of change. Um, this is a question, uh, by the way, just remind you, we do have a tip jar at the bottom of this. Uh, we are making a fund uh, for some of the people, particularly in the performing arts, who've been hit very hard by basically losing uh, all their work. And uh, we're also trying to keep some of the venues as well, some of the, the venues around the country. We're trying to make sure we have enough of a fund to help them keep going as well, because when this is all over, hopefully there'll be other things we want to see apart from that corner of the sky. Though I am becoming very, very close to that corner of the sky. I've really been enjoying it. Um, Jen would like to know, uh, Sarah, when you were a child, were you interested in those ideas of things like atlantis do you have a secret urge to find a lost, find civilization? A lost civilization so yeah so um definitely not not atlantis as as a young child you know i haven't grown up in the 1980s um i grew up on national geographic magazine so i would happily scamper to our mailbox um every other month every month uh to to sort of look through and hope that there was a story about archaeology or, or ancient Egypt. As I got to high school and college, I started learning more about uh, Atlantis, which I'm very sad to say does not exist. It is a figment of Plato's imagination. It is a <laughs> long con. Um, yeah. Oh, Plato, you and your great big undersea uh, shadow you've been staring I, I know. at. Urgh. So sadly, Plato does not exist. And, and this whole, it's sort of a mythology around a, a lost civilization because civilizations are never really lost. Um, so many ancient cultures are not actually ancient. Look at the Maya, look at the Inca, look at so many diverse indigenous cultures across the world. Um, they, they still exist, they're still thriving, they still have beautiful music and art and, uh, and language that, uh, and so many connections to who they were um, hundreds if not thousands of, of years ago. So in many ways that this concept is, is incredibly harmful. Um, now there are definitely civilizations that um, we have yet to find. You know, I think that the greatest area um, or the area that, that has the greatest potential for discovery is actually the heart uh, the rainforested area of Central Africa. Um, that's never been fully explored by archaeologists. Um, I think using new technologies like LIDAR, um, it could completely rewrite the history of, uh, of the African continent. So we have all of these amazing things that are left to find. You know, when I was a kid, of course, I dreamed about finding beautiful things in the sandbox, right? I see that with our, our seven-year-old son. He's obsessed with gems and finding treasure, and it's, it's glorious. Um, but of course, I had those dreams as a kid, but um, but now I see, you know, it's it's not about, to me, it's the looking that's the fun. Uh, it's not always the finding. 
Don't look in the Ark of the Covenant. Well. It doesn't you know well. that. Um, this is a live question. Uh, Chris, this is for you, and it's from Chris, which is, where do you stand on Planet Nine? Oh, this is interesting. So this, this is, is interesting. Idea. So this is the idea that our solar system has another giant planet out beyond Neptune and, and beyond Pluto's orbit. And there are there are some um, features of the outer solar system in the arrangement of the, the rubble that we know is out there that makes more sense if you have uh, another large planet. And, and the idea came up a few years ago. Astronomers have been looking for it and haven't found it yet. And, and some of the people I trust most on this stuff think that if it was there they would have found it but not everyone agrees it's a live argument um and i think it would be my, my main opinion is that it would be great i'd love another planet out there um i think it's a bit surprising to people that there could be another giant planet if we're used to looking at distant galaxies as we were talking about with katie a, a, a second ago it's quite strange that we wouldn't know our backyard but planets are pretty faint and if you've got a planet out there, it will be very cold, so it won't um, be very bright. It won't have much of the sun's light to re reflect. Uh, and so it, it may, there may well be something sort of the size of Uranus lurking out there. Um, we'll know we're building a telescope called the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, which will hopefully start operating in a year or two's time. And, and that's a survey of the whole sky, and it will be big enough and deep enough that it will rule Planet Nine in or out one way or the other. So we're not sure. It's worth looking. Can I, can, I ask question. Question, can I ask that question? Because like I, this is so cool. Um, what what are the naming conventions around a planet? Who gets to name it? I mean, planet McPlanety Face, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I, I mean, that, that works for me. And and we have to remember Uranus, which perhaps isn't the most successful name. That was was called George for a while because uh, Herschel, who discovered it, wanted to name it after the king. But um, um, so we don't have naming conventions for a planet. Um, we have naming conventions for things because we, we haven't needed them for 150 years or so um, for things at the end of the solar system at the edge of the solar system in the Kuiper Belt we name them after um, deities or figures from underworld uh, legends from many different cultures so there's things like Maki Maki which I think is a Hawaiian legend and and and, and so on so my guess is we we'd be looking for uh, an un, sort of a, a underworld death related god hopefully from a culture that isn't Western. It'd be quite nice to have, have one of our, our other legends from this planet represented in the outer solar system. But um, yeah, Planet Nine can't be the permanent name. It's it's so boring and catalogy, and it annoys the Pluto people. Yeah, we've seen 50s movie though, isn't it? We must go to Planet Nine, where yeah. there are many women dressed in silver boob tubes. They will destroy us. You know, the to various terrible images we had of the uh, future space exploration. Um, we've run, nearly run out of time. I'm gonna. I want to ask this to, to Helen. Other, you you uh, others, you might have an opinion on this, but I think it's quite an interesting one. Stephen wants to know. Uh, can you ask them about calculations and modeling in their disciplines? Now, I think very often when we hear about kind of models, whether it's kind of ideas of climate change or anything else, we will often hear from uh, pundits, you know, attack it. Or, you know, it's only a model, you know. And can you tell us a little bit about how that works? works? So, so the way to think about a model is it's like a flight simulator. Um, if you imagine training a pilot, what you do in order to save them crashing lots of planes and killing lots of people is you give them a computer setup that does all the things that you know planes do. And even though it hasn't already done all the things a pilot might do, it's got some it's got some physics built into it that says if the pilot does this, the plane will do this. And that lets a pilot effectively run through simulations of flying a plane. And that is basically how models work, especially the big ones like climate models. So so, so modeling and calculations come in two parts normally. Um, well, several different ones, but you can split them broadly into two. There's, there's process models, which are actually what I do, which is that um, we can see something happening in the real world. We follow every single little bit of physics. We build everything up from scratch and build and build. So we start from the littlest things and we get to a, a physical picture which has all the things in it. But then the problem is we can't build a computer big enough to contain the whole planet if we take in every every tiny little thing. So then what we do is we make this link that may happen more than once, which is we say, well, the outcome of all of this is that if this happens, then that tends to happen. And then so what gets taken up is this broader connection that we know if the temperature goes up, then this other thing does this. And those are what get built into the flight simulator. 
And then you can run your models, which are basically, you know, and, and you can, the advantage obviously of a model is that we've only got one planet in the case of the Earth. So we can't just test, we can't have controlled studies where we do one thing on one planet and one thing on another. So that flight simulator can be run twice and it can be our controlled study. And in fact, it's not just twice. They run things like ensemble models where they run it thousands of times and see the probabilities of what happened. So so in, in the Earth and environmental sciences, it's those two models. You get process stuff and then you get the big models that join all the pieces together, but don't actually have all the physics in them. And, you know, they and we're constantly testing. And that's the con that's the other thing that models are. You evolve, you know, every time you learn a new piece of data, you check. And then if things don't work, you have to rewrite things and, and alter that what's gone into your flight simulator until it matches reality. Thank you very much. We've got, I just have a few final questions, which are really for everyone, which is, uh, James would like to know, which you channels do you recommend during lockdown? Is there anywhere in particular you've been finding your, I have to admit, I've mainly been finding myself listening to old Desert Island Discs of late. They're really, there's some wonderful ones with uh, with, with, with scientists. I'm catching up with with uh, all, of, all of that stuff. Um, so uh, what have you been, uh, is there anywhere in particular on the internet you found yourself uh, feeding your curiosity? Oh, I've, I've just I've just spouted a lot. I feel someone else should. <laughs> Do you know it's only because everyone else dropped out, so I went straight yeah. on for you. But I think Sarah's come so back. So Sarah, are, are you looking? Because I mean, there are so many great sites with a lot of lectures, a lot of them. lectures on them, and you know that that kind of thing. Have you, uh, is, is there anywhere in particular you'd steer people? Okay, so well, I have to give for a uh, for a wonderful organization called Skype a Scientist. Um, so if you're a teacher or educator, if you if you get kids at home, it's this wonderful program where you can go online. It's totally free. Um, you sign up and you can have one of hundreds, I think thousands of scientists, biologists, chemists, uh, computer scientists, archaeologists, anthropologists actually speak to you in your classroom. Um, so I, I think they do great work. And, and in this time, I think I think everyone should should check them out. Um, Helen, have, uh, anything you'd recommend? Yeah, so I think there is a new breed of YouTube ca channel coming along, which is still growing, but it's going to get a lot bigger and a lot more interesting. And that is the museums, because obviously all mm. museums have their doors shut and they're all going, oh, but we've, they're all all going, all oh, but we've all still got all these interesting things and these interesting stories. And it's actually a push to tell those stories in new ways. So it's just starting. Um, I'm a trustee yeah. of Royal Museums Greenwich, uh, as Chris was before me. And we're starting this program of, you know, bringing the collections online and I think a lot of museums if you look at all the not just the big museums but also the smaller ones uh, are starting to ask this question how do we share and of course it's even better because you can it's brilliant to see physical objects but there's even more people you can reach who couldn't ever come to the physical museum itself and you can now share these stories so I would look for museums in general. That's uh, that's a great idea. I really hope the Aubrey Beardsley exhibition at the Tate Room, by the way, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, Chris, I think has dis disappeared again, so uh, I don't have to. I'm going to put the pressure on you now. This is from Jonathan. What is your favourite prog track, Sarah? It's Wait. a tough one, isn't it? Okay, hold on. So prog rock. Do you have? Have you? I think there's a presumption from Jonathan that all scientists mainly will listen to Kim King Crimson and Yes and Early Genesis. That might be kind of one of those ideas. Uh, let's find out. Chris, favorite prog rock track? No oh, idea. Pass. No. Helen. Helen. Prog rock. No, no. Don't, don't. Crimson, Sarah. Right, there we go. It turns out it's a bit. I remember years ago when we were doing a tour. There's Brian, Ben Goldacre, various others, and one of the audience questions was, "What do you guys think of the Big Bang Theory, as in the TV series?" And at that point, none of us had seen it, and the audience were furious, and they couldn't believe that we. I can tell you what I think about it. I hate it. Oh, I don't like it either. I don't like it either. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I just watch Friday Night Dinner. It's my favourite thing. Uh, it's an absolute joy. Uh, one final question. This is from Paul. Paul would like to know, do you have any suggestions for reading material for 8 to 12-year-olds, fact or fiction? I will quickly throw in uh, the novels of, of, of Christopher Edge, which I would definitely say between you know 9 and 12 years old. He's, he's done various. He's done some great historical novels. He's done some really lovely ones, which are novels which also deal with big ideas of, of, of physics, of uh, many worlds, um and uh and and such and i really recommend so christopher edge is someone i would recommend um anyone here what would you what are your let's start with uh, sarah uh book recommendations for eight year old fact or fiction 
Oh, boy. Um, so I really got into um, Piers Anthony, who's a wonderful fantasy writer when I was about 10, 11 years old. He's brilliant. Um, uh, so I, I think he's great. I think um, N.K. Jemisin is fantastic. Um, and as well as Nindi Okorafor, um, she's written some absolutely extraordinary um, African futurism books that will just are just completely different than anything I've ever read before. And they're absolutely perfect. So look up Nandi Okora for, for sure. Chris, you're frozen again. Helen. <laughs> um, when I was between, when I was between eight and 12, I was reading a lot of sci-fi. So a lot of Asimov and the foundation series and Dune and that kind of thing. But actually, if you want cheering up and a little bit of sci-fi in these times, Terry Pratchett, just all the brilliant ideas that are slightly twisted, that are so incisive. That's, um, so Terry Pratchett all the way. Uh, Chris, very quickly, if we've still see got what you, let's see how long we link last. Yeah, but my friend Emily Lapdawala has a list of, of space books for kids on her Planetary Society site, so go there. Brilliant. Um, um, thank, thank you, you all. all very much. There's a lot of questions we didn't get to. Thank you very much, everyone who sent questions. Thank you very much. Matt Sieber had a very interesting uh, question, uh, basically about uh, the fabric of space time, which I decided was uh, was not going to last a, a minute. So we'll come, Matt. I we will come back and we'll do that question next week. Loads of other questions. We'll try and do them as a rollover for next week. Um, go and follow everyone's uh, work. Helen, by the way, was talking about things on YouTube, etc. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, she does a series with the European Space Agency. That's going to be up as far as I know on cosmicshambles.com uh, Chris has a new book out about the Zooniverse uh, Helen has a newish book about uh, out called uh, Storm in a Teacup uh, Sarah also who I know is working on a new book but uh, all about her work Archaeology from Space um, I highly recommend those things if you can order those books from independent booksellers because a lot of them are very very close to going down at the moment and a lot of them are working as hard as possible so if you do have a local independent bookseller also I mentioned the Big Green book shop the other day that's been doing a lot and uh, bookseller crow and there's loads of other ones as well you might have a favorite try and support them if you can and uh, also i'd like to say if you can uh, subscribe to our youtube channel and uh, also we have as well as the uh, the collection we're doing we also have our normal patreon uh, which is how we make book shambles and all of our science content as well we don't make money from it we just put it all back into uh, into making more shows so if you can subscribe to our patreon that will be wonderful uh, we're going to end on some music and uh, so first of all thank you very much helen sarah and chris bye bye you don't have to go yet you can stay but i had to do some kind of goodbye because that's the way it works on daytime science q and a's during lockdown that's the new grammar of it all uh are we going to end i mentioned this before uh jed potts and uh from from blues water but also does a lot of other work as well uh on this uh, 50th anniversary of apollo 13 here he is with the song talking apollo 13 blues Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the Q&A. See you next week or tomorrow where we have uh, Stuart Lee and Sam West. And annoyingly for Sam West, I will talk about his work to some extent, but I mainly want to talk about his mum and dad going down canals on their narrow boats because it's my favourite thing is watching Timothy West and Prunella Scales. And it was something that if you haven't done it before, is a really joyous thing to do during lockdown as well because it's just lovely. Here's Jed Potts. Bye-bye. <laughs> Once upon a time in the United States would unfold the story of three crewmates. To go to the moon was their intention, and what would speed things up would be an ear infection. Al Shepard's ear, if you must know. Meniere's disease, if you want to split hairs. Another problem for these spacefaring fellas would be a supposed case of German rubella. Measles is the other name for this disease, and it sure made NASA mighty uneasy, because when you're landing on the moon, it's a lousy time to get six. Another command module pilot they would have to pick. Enter Jack Swigert. Come on, Rookie Park, that thing. When the day of the launch was finally here, the skies around the Cape were bright and clear. Ecom go, GNC go, Fido go, Enco go flight. It's go for launch, light up that rocket, but let's all take a moment to stop and gawk at Lovell Hayes and Swigert on that Saturn V. It's the moon or bus boys, T minus five, four, three, two, one. Lift off, ex Luna Scientia. Head for the hills, boys. Next stop, Fra Mora Highlands. A short while later, they were well on their way, and without being too cocky, it was probably safe to say a successful moon landing was as good as in the bank until the boys in Mission Control asked the crew to stir up a cryo tank. There was a real loud bang, and all hell broke loose, and the thing flew around like a headless goose. And just when they were getting it to stay in one place, they looked out and saw they were venting something into space. 
Turned out to be the oxygen. Houston, we've had a problem. At mission control, it was clear within the hour. The ship was losing air, but also losing power. To get the crew home safe was the new objective of the mission, but to turn the ship around was too risky a proposition. They wouldn't land on the moon, but they'd still have to go around. With the oxygen last, so they were back on the ground. To lose an American in space is out of the question. Get our boys home with time to spare. Failure is not an option. So they powered down the ship to save what was left, and it got so cold it would freeze your breath. It would take three days to get home from the moon, and problems that occurred along the way would include, but not be limited to, blocked CO2 scrubbers, Fred Hayes' urine infection, and the possibility of splashdown in the middle of a typhoon. A very cold three days later, the most dangerous part was yet to come. Reentry was drawing near. Would the damaged spaceship's heat shields hold, or would it burn up in the atmosphere? Stand by for communications blackout. This radio silence should last three minutes, but that had come and gone. Everybody in Houston held their breath as time dragged on and on. Odyssey, this is Houston, do you copy? 13, this is Houston, do you copy? 13, this is Houston, do you copy? Then out of the sky, a most glorious sight, three parachutes did appear. Roger that, Houston, this is 13, we read you loud and clear. Everyone rejoiced, cigars were smoked, what an adventure this had been. And that's the story of a successful failure, the story of Apollo 13.